Lord, those words reflect our own hearts, I pray this morning. A fresh recognition that everything but you is a faltering foundation, sinking sand. Lord Jesus, you are the only rock, the only hope, the only help for sinners like us. We dare not turn anywhere else. No one else could satisfy our needs. No one else could take care of our sins. No one else could with compassion and love and tenderness deal with us who are frail and feeble. Lord, we thank you for who you are and your character and your person. And we thank you that you have looked down on us with pity and have rescued us with power, drawn us to yourself in your kindness and love. We pray this morning to reflect again on what it means to be your sheep under your tender shepherding care. We ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd invite you to turn in your Bible this morning to John chapter 10 and this wonderfully rich and sweet description of Jesus, the good shepherd. There is perhaps no more criminal enterprise in the world than bad religion. Human systems, denominations that are overseen by unbelief. They are run and operated by people who don't know God and yet claim to speak on God's behalf. It is religion for power. They promise spiritual insight and they take people's money. They sell empty hope and rob people of eternity. They are oppressing the vulnerable and the needy in order to maintain power and control. With the appearance of godliness, but no power over sin and no help for the needy, they are criminal. A religious criminal enterprise. Maybe some of you grew up in such systems. There is a deal that goes on in man-made religion. A deal between the power brokers of those religions and the people under them. And the deal goes something like this. You come and increase my empire, you line my pocketbooks, and I'll give you vain, empty, hopeless promises. Promises that I could somehow make your relationship to God right if you go through my ceremonies. That I could assuage your guilt and cleanse your conscience. It give you hope that if you just try hard enough in my religious system, God might be okay with you. I'll tell you nice things about yourself. You're not as bad as you may think you are. We're actually all pretty good and we just need to try hard. But, but you need to try hard in my system under my roof so I can build my empire. And if you do that, then I'll tell you you're pretty much doing okay. It's a deal that people who don't like the idea of repentance, enjoy. I can go be a part of a system, check off a box, do some mechanical, materialistic, outwardly physical, somewhat impressive moral things, feel like I'm good with whatever God may be out there, and go about my life. It has no true hope. Such systems can't give life They promise things they can't provide. In John chapter 10, we are going to see some of the characteristics of bad religion. In John chapter 10, we'll see what it means to be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of all, in John chapter 10, I hope that we see the sweet character of our shepherd. What a contrast it is to follow Jesus over and against everything else out there. We talked last week about the backdrops of this chapter. One of the major themes of the Bible is God as a shepherd, tenderly caring for his people, and God's people as sheep, vulnerable, needy, 
dependent. We saw as a backdrop of this chapter, the bad shepherds of Israel historically. And we saw as a backdrop of this chapter, the healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9. I want to think back through John chapter 9 and and turn back a chapter and look at verse 1 of John 9. And we won't read this whole story, but I want to refresh our minds about this narrative. In John 9, 1, Jesus passed by. He saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus is not saying that this man was sinless, nor that his parents were sinless, but that there was no causal relationship between his blindness and any particular sin in their lives, as was commonly held, taught by the religious leadership in Jesus' day. Now, something else is going on here. What is going on? The works of God are about to be displayed. Who's going to do those works of God? Jesus will. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. The man took Jesus' command at face value, did what he said, and went and washed and saw for the first time. Can you imagine living your whole life in darkness and one day seeing? Verse 13 begins the interrogation. The religious leadership is incensed. One would think that they would rejoice. They ought to have rejoiced. They were the teachers of Israel. They knew their Old Testaments. They they knew that there was a promised one coming. One who would even give sight to the blind. Here is demonstrable proof that such a contender was here. Should this not be investigated with hope and anticipation and joy dancing in the streets? That is not their response. They interrogated the man, then his parents. Look down at verse 18. The Jews, most of the people in this narrative are Jewish. This word for Jews in John here is a pejorative for the religious leadership and the unbelieving nation. The Jews did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight. Uh, That's amazing. They disregarded his own personal testimony. It would be hard to hide the excitement of seeing for the first time. Until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, and they interrogated his parents. And his parents were too afraid of the religious power brokers to give a straightforward answer. But the man himself was bold enough to speak the truth. Look at verse 22. His parents didn't give a straight answer because they were afraid of the Jews. The Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed Jesus to be Messiah... He was to be put out of the synagogue. You were excommunicated, desynagogued, thrown out of the cultural life of what it meant to live in Israel as a Jew. If you even so much as hinted that Jesus might be the Messiah. So they were quiet. Look at verse 34. After interrogating the man again, they answered, You were born entirely in sins, and you are teaching us? It's a remarkable response to having interrogated the man, not believed that he was the blind beggar and now sees, then interrogated his parents, ostensibly now believing that he was the blind man, but the problem was Jesus healed him on a Saturday, and we don't like Jesus, and we're going to find out in John, the end of John 11, that even if they recognize that Jesus heals the blind and raises the dead. If word of that gets out, we lose our power and position. You start to see what's really going on here. They believe at face value that the man, in fact, is the one born blind and has now been healed. And their response to him is simply, you were born in sins. Don't teach us. And the problem with the man born blind is he is a very visible public demonstration of the Pharisees' blindness, their obstinate rebellion. Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the the, the one that's been anticipated and waited for for centuries is here, and they are rejecting him outright. Look at the man's response in verse 35. 
Jesus heard that they had put him out. Finding him, Jesus said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Whatever Jesus is going to tell me, I'm going to believe. Jesus said, you have seen him and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And look where the belief led him. And he worshiped him. This blind man's exodus from bad religion reveals a few things for us. This man has made an exit from man-made traditions and an abuse of God's word that constituted an apostate Judaism. And his exit from that system puts a number of things on display. It puts on display the criminality of Israel's illegitimate shepherds. It puts on display the authority of Israel's good shepherd. And it displays the loyalty of the good shepherd's sheep. That's what we're looking at this morning. The bad shepherds, the good shepherd, and the sheep. Let's look first at the criminality of Israel's illegitimate shepherds. Look at John 10 verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. There's no break between John 9 and John 10. In fact, the phrase, truly, truly, I say to you, in the gospel narratives, in Jesus' speech, always follows other things that are being taught. It is not a break to a new topic. This picks up from previous teaching or previous events. The audience of John 10, when Jesus is saying, I say to you, is none other than the Pharisees. This becomes clear in verse 6 because they do not understand. In verse 26, they don't understand and don't believe because they're not his sheep. Jesus is very specifically addressing them. John 10 there is the indictment of the Pharisees themselves. It's an indictment of Israel's apostate spiritual condition as a nation marked most prominently in her leadership. So in verse 1, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, that is to apostate Israel and her leaders, the one who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. This fold of the sheep, the sheep fold, the sheep pen. This was an outdoor enclosure made of stone walls, mostly with open sky, possibly some shade, but high enough walls to give some shelter from the elements. The sheepfold provided protection from enemies, human enemies that would try to come in and steal sheep or predatory animals that wanted to get in and eat them. In the countryside, you would often have a sheepfold attached to your house. And it would be enough to keep your own sheep. But in town, the sheepfolds were separated from individual houses. They were, in fact, large, public, multi-family use sheepfolds. There they housed multiple flocks. And multiple families could have their flocks in a common sheepfold. And they could hire one sheep tender, one doorkeeper, who would stay at the gate and make sure they didn't get out and they were protected. That's the idea here. This is a communal sheepfold with multiple flocks inside. There is a door described in verse 1. <clears throat> the door of such a sheepfold was one singular opening in the stone wall. To go up another way meant to not use the door. And the only other way to get into a sheepfold like this would be to climb over the wall. And anybody who climbed over the wall would be suspect. Such a one would most likely be a thief and a robber. And Jesus uses two words to describe such suspect characters. The word for thief is the idea of a sneak. You know, someone who doesn't want to be detected. He's a cat burglar or in this case, a sheep burglar. He, he doesn't want anybody to know what he's doing. And so he's sneaking around, getting over the wall. The second word is the word for robber. And this is a, a one who uses violence or a, a force, overwhelming force in order to get in and to steal. It's the word used for a brigand or a pirate. And so those who are not entering by the door, but climb up some other way, are thieves and robbers 
This is a figure of speech. We know that from verse 6. Jesus said this figure of speech. Jesus spoke to them. This figure of speech is indicating a real historical reality. The sheepfold here, I believe, is Israel. The nation of Israel, the the apostate nation, the the backslidden nation that has walked away from God's truth and God's promises and loyalty to God. Yet within apostate Israel, there is an internal remnant, what the Bible calls a spiritual Israel. That is, Israelites who are spiritual. That is, those who are born of God. They are the elect of Israel. They are a subset of apostate Israel. In other words, God keeps a remnant. God keeps his own sheep, even within the apostate nation. The door here simply is a reference to lawful entry. Who is it that could have access as a shepherd into the sheepfold of Israel and lead God's people? Some other way would be an indication of those who lack credentials for spiritual leadership of the nation. Those who have usurped power. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 23. John 10 is not the only place where Jesus indicts the spiritual leaders of Israel for their oppression, for their usurpation. For their mistreatment of sheep. Matthew 23, 13 begins a series of woes, and a woe is a calling down of rightful judgment from God upon some miserable rebel. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. The scribes were those whose job it was to write out and preserve God's word. They would have been intimately familiar with the Bible. And the Pharisees, the ones who were to lead and to teach God's people, Jesus calls them hypocrites. Because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. You do not enter it yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses, and for pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation." Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, that's nothing. Whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold of the temple, uh, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that's nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he's obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar, swears both by the altar and everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple, swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. Whoever swears by heaven, swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. In detail, he's calling out their hypocrisy. For a show, they're doing religious things, but it is all empty of true honoring of God. Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin, and you've neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside appear beautiful, but inside full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we'd been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. You testify against yourselves. You are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence 
of hell. Those are strong words. And a list of woes and indictments against these very leaders to whom Jesus speaks in John 10. They are the thieves and the robbers. Turn the page to the right to the end of John 11 and verse 48. There is a conspiracy to kill Jesus. Enemies amongst the Jewish leadership conspire together. They become friends because they have a common enemy. We have to get rid of this Jesus. They even conspire to kill Lazarus. They couldn't deny that Jesus had raised him from the dead. So they had to rebury the evidence. What would be the result if everyone heard that Jesus was raising the dead? Verse 48 of John 11. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Do you understand the motivation there? If you were witness to someone who could take a man born blind and make him see, or to make a lame man jump for joy, or to make a dead man walk out of his own grave, shouldn't you say, I want to be on his team? He's stronger than blindness. He's tougher than lameness. He beat up death itself. And these leaders of Israel have made themselves enemies of the greatest hope of the universe for the human plight because they want to maintain a puny little kingdom of phony religion and personal power. It's a bad trade. The glory of God was not in the temple anymore. The temple was overrun by thieves and robbers, by posers who pretended to know God and who actually blocked the way to the true knowledge of God. Consider what the religious leadership did in regard to the poor blind beggar in John 9. They blamed him for his condition. They spoke for God when they did not know God. Oh yeah, you're blind because you sinned. They don't know that. And they put themselves in the place of God to speak for him, and they have no idea God's thoughts on this. They are full of self-righteousness and pride, grasping at power and position, and a poor, needy sheep. One who is most in need of their care and provision. They ran him over and they ran him out. Look down at verse 6. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, that is to the Pharisees, but they did not understand what these things were which he'd been saying to them. They didn't understand. What do we learn about the religious leadership here? Well, they're corrupt, criminal, oppressors, and they're also not sheep. Verse 26, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. They shouldn't be shepherds. They shouldn't be leaders over Israel. They don't even belong to spiritual Israel. They're unlawful, sneaky, violent. They gain unlawful entry into the sheepfold. They enter and brutalize the sheep in the language of Ezekiel 34. They oppress and steal and destroy for their own benefit and gain. They want power, money, control, and the esteem of men. We should suspect someone who climbs over the wall to be up to no good. If you think about intertestamental history, the, the period of history between the closing of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament, the 400 silent years. What happened to Israel during that time? Well, the Greeks overran the whole territory, and under Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, Jewish leadership got in league with the Greeks in order to have power over the temple precincts. And they sold out fidelity to Yahweh in order to have power. And when the Romans ran the Greeks out, the same deals were made. And so what you have in Jesus' day is the leadership is in league with the pagan rulers. They actually have to rent the priestly garb from the Romans. Israel does not have sovereignty in this time. And the way that Jewish leadership is able to maintain power and control is to be in league with those who were totally opposed to God and his ways. They made a deal with the devil. The people should have been suspect of those who had 
not gone in lawfully to leadership over Israel. They were usurpers and oppressors. The contrast here in chapter 10, beginning in verse 2, is a contrast to the good shepherd. The good shepherd does not oppress for power, prestige, and money. The good shepherd seeks and calls and leads his sheep to safety and provision and care. Look down at verse 2. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. This is uh, not a very helpful translation. Your English Bible should read the shepherd. Jesus is meant here, not just any shepherd. Jesus is not talking about pastors or under shepherds or those kinds of things. There are certainly things for pastors to learn from Jesus' example as a good shepherd here. But Jesus is talking about himself. It is possible to translate this, he who enters by the door is shepherd, meaning he's qualitatively shepherd-like, not thief-like. He's there to protect and provide, not to steal and to kill. But I believe this should be read, he is the shepherd. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And just like Jesus says of himself in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is talking about himself. This is a claim by Jesus to be the Messiah, the promised shepherd from Ezekiel 34, 11, where God himself said, I will come personally to shepherd my sheep. And in Ezekiel 34, God said he would come personally to shepherd his sheep and to rescue them from Israel's self-serving, self-styled pseudo-shepherds. The one who comes through the door is unique. He's the only one. He is the shepherd. And notice what he does. He seeks. He enters by the door, verse 2. And verse 3, the doorkeeper opens. This means that Jesus seeks by lawful entry. He is entering the sheepfold for his sheep. But he's doing so not as a thief and a robber over the wall, sneaking around or taking it by violence. He's coming in the right way. Galatians 4.4 4 says that Christ was born under law to redeem those under law. Luke 2 indicates that he was lawfully brought into the temple on the eighth day, circumcised. He was presented in the temple. And we know that Jesus was perfectly obedient to every command of God and Mosaic law under which he was born. Jesus carries with him messianic credentials. He is, by Genesis 3.15's promise, a seed of the woman, by Genesis 12, a descendant of Abraham. By Genesis 49, of the tribe of Judah. By 2 Samuel 7, a descendant of David. By Micah 5.2, born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 7.14, born of a virgin. And according to Isaiah 11, not only a branch of David, that is a descendant of David, but he is also the root of David, that is David's own creator. And he fulfills the credentials listed in Ezekiel 34 and 37. The shepherd, the new David, who would come and rescue his sheep. This shepherd who comes through the door is legit. He came lawfully through the door, through messianic credentials, into the sheepfold of apostate Israel to get his own sheep. This is a contrast to those climbing over the wall as thieves. This shepherd comes through the door. And look at verse 3. He not only seeks his sheep, um, but he comes and it's easy for him in seeking the sheep. The, the doorkeeper opens for him. Uh, the doorkeeper in a sheep pen would be the, the, the single individual who would man the entrance point. And if there were several flocks and the shepherds belonging to those various flocks, they only needed one doorkeeper. He would stand at the door and let the appropriate shepherd in for the appropriate flocks. And at nighttime, he would lay down at the entranceway and sheep would not step over his body and he would be aware if somebody tried to come through the door. I don't believe there is a need to identify this doorkeeper in verse 3. Again, this is a figure of speech. I don't think it's helpful to stretch every detail of these figures of speeches. Figures of speech? That's only one speech, one figure. I believe the point in verse 3 is simply to indicate the ease of entry for the rightful shepherd. If Jesus intended that the doorkeeper be identified, if it's possible that, that Jesus is telling this parable and he wanted you to know who the doorkeeper was, you perhaps could go to the Old Testament prophets and the last Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist, 
who opened the door or paved the way or made a highway for Messiah. Uh, That's one conceivable possibility. If we think about implications for this parable beyond Jesus' day with apostate Israel, uh, what does it mean for uh, people to open the door for the sheep? Perhaps this is a reference to the Holy Spirit who opens hearts uh, for Jesus to come in. I don't think that's the intent here. In fact, commentators go further and identify seven different doorkeepers, and they argue with each other about which view is right. I believe this simply indicates that because Jesus is doing the will of his father, verse 29, he has his owner's, he has owner's interest in the sheep. And the contrast in verse 12 to a hired hand makes that clear. Jesus has owner's interest in the sheep, and he therefore cannot be barred from rightful entry. And so whatever doorkeeper would be there would open for Jesus coming in and getting his sheep. Jesus himself declared, I have come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, for the remnant, the spiritual Israel within natural, physical Israel. Now in verse 16 of John 10, Jesus is going to expand that. He says, I have other sheep not of this fold, and I must bring them also. That's a reference to the Gentiles. Uh, That is a preview of what uh, Paul describes in Romans chapter 11, that Jews and Gentiles together make up the redemptive plan of God, all purchased by Christ. Jesus as shepherd will get Gentiles for himself too. But here what he has in view is going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in verse 3, we, we notice he doesn't just seek them, but he calls them. To him, the doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. He calls his own sheep by name. This is so tender, personal, relational. Notice they are his own sheep. They're his before he retrieves them. And he calls them by name. That means the the sheep aren't lost in a crowd as if Jesus is just interested in one big, blurry, fluffy collective. No, but he is rescuing individual people in personal, individual relationship to them. In Matthew 9, 9, he called out Matthew. In Luke 19, 5, Jesus called Zacchaeus by name. In John 1.43, by name, he called out Philip. And of Nathaniel in John 1.48, he said, I knew you before you knew anything about me. In John 11, Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave by name. And in John 20, verse 16, at the site of the tomb, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to Mary. Mary assumes him to be the groundskeeper. And Jesus says to him, woman... Woman, and then he says to her, Mary, by name. And she turns and recognizes her Savior, risen from the dead. Jesus seeking and calling his sheep is so sweet, tender, personal, individual, affectionate. He seeks them, he calls them, and he leads them. Look at the end of verse 3. He leads them out. And then in verse 4, he puts forth his own. He leads them out is the word for exodus. It's a familiar term. The same Greek word in the New Testament used of the exodus from Egypt in Acts 7, Acts 13, and Hebrews 8. It was used, interestingly, of disciples getting out of prison in Acts 5, Acts 12, and Acts 16. Here, this exodus is the exodus of a blind beggar out of bad religion. Individually called and personally led out in an individualized exodus from death into life by the shepherd. Verse 4 says, he puts forth all his own. Again, you see the ownership of the sheep by Jesus here. This puts them forth in verse 4 is the same word as used in chapter 9, verse 34. Look at this. The Pharisees answered the blind beggar, you were born entirely in sins and you're teaching us. So they put him out, cast him out, threw him out, excommunicated him, desynagogued him. 
And notice what Jesus says about the shepherd with the sheep in verse 4. When he puts out all his own. The religious leadership wanted the blind beggar out of here. And Jesus tenderly wanted the blind beggar out of there. You see what's going on here? The sovereignty of our Lord overruling the bad intentions of evil oppressors to tenderly care for his own people. What a good shepherd he is. Jesus is actually leading the man out of apostate Judaism while the Pharisees are excommunicating him. Jesus is the sovereign orchestrator. He is the good shepherd entering the sheepfold of Israel and leading his own sheep out individually in personal exodus. This figure of speech in John 10, spoken to the religious leaders, is about Jesus seeking and calling and leading his people out leading his people out of the backslidden and corrupted system they were trapped by. And so this is simultaneously an indictment of the leadership and a rescue of the oppressed. Jesus, the good shepherd, is retrieving his own sheep from out of the population of people oppressed by human traditions and oppressed by the abuse of God's word, wielded by self-serving power brokers bent on maintaining their positions of power. Think about this with John 9 and the blind beggar. They should have cared for him and they expelled him. I mean, what good was a blind beggar to them? He couldn't contribute to their lifestyle. He couldn't contribute to the esteem they wanted before men. He was pointless in their pursuit of power and prestige and filling their pocketbooks. But worse than all of that, this blind beggar was prima facie evidence that this Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Here he is, walking around, seeing for the first time, demonstrating before the world that the Pharisees were phonies and frauds and hypocrites, and demonstrating to the world that their arch enemy was none other than Messiah. Notice verse 4. Look how Jesus leads his sheep. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. He goes ahead of them. Now, everything I know about sheep is secondhand. Well, I do have firsthand experience of the sheep pen at the Phoenix Zoo. That firsthand experience was sort of anticlimactic. The the sheep were dirtier and smellier than I expected. You know, I kind of expected... Cotton balls on toothpicks. You go hug one of these things. They're not particularly huggable. Everything else I know about sheep comes from books and stories. So I'm not a sheepologist. I'm just going to share what I had to learn from other people. Middle Eastern shepherds lead their sheep. They go before their sheep. They walk out in front of the sheep and and they talk to their sheep with the particular sing-song voice that the shepherd uses and that the sheep recognize. That's different, apparently, than English sheep herding, which you find in Australia and New Zealand and America and everywhere else the English went. In the empire, sheep are driven like cattle with sheepdogs and other animals. But the Middle Eastern shepherd, even to this day, goes out before the sheep. He goes ahead and and the sheep follow him. That is what Jesus says here. What does this tell us about our good shepherd? He's tender, calls his sheep by name, individually, personal, relational, He goes out in front. Whatever dangers are there, he's leading the way. And the sheep follow him as he speaks in his unique shepherd's voice. But this also demonstrates for us the strength of our shepherd. It in fact demonstrates the absolute sovereignty of our shepherd, his lordship, Not only over the sheep, but over all things. It demonstrates his power. Not the 
selfish, self-aggrandizing power of the hypocrite religious leaders, but of good power. Omnipotence wed to infinite goodness demonstrates his authority. We see here the authority of the good shepherd. Jesus went in and got his sheep. What could the pirates and the brigands and the cat burglars do about the sovereign Lord of the universe stepping into the apostate sheep pen and rescuing his own? They couldn't stop him. He just went in and got him. In John chapter 9, Jesus went into Israel in the midst of the thieves and the wall-leaping robber Pharisees, and he got one of his own sheep. Healing a blind man is Jesus' demonstration, not only of his credentials to be the shepherd over Israel, but of his absolute sovereign power to go and get his own, to secure them for himself, to bring them to safety and provision. John 9 is the demonstration of all these things. John 10 is the explanation of it. In speaking this way to the Pharisees, Jesus is telling them, guess what I just did? with the blind beggar, right in front of you. And it's an indictment of your bankrupt leadership. And it is a self-declaration of my credentials as Messiah. That is what John 10 is. I'm explaining to you religious leaders what I just did by helping the blind beggar. Jesus said he was born blind so that the work of God might be displayed through him. That means a lot. We might think at that statement, man, how incredible would it be to see for the first time and have that story as a personal testimony? That's true. A life of blindness leading up to that is a tough life. But there's a bigger story going on here than the personal testimony of the man born blind. It is the demonstration to a nation that Jesus is the only hope. That he actually gives life. It puts teeth to Jesus' claim, I am the light of the world. And it demonstrates his sovereign and personal care when he says, I am the good shepherd. And so the man was born blind to set the stage for Christ's glorification in this sign. Do you ever think about your own trials that way? Your own hardships, however long they may be, however long you endure in them, God is likely up to much bigger things than you're aware. He's a good shepherd. He doesn't waste trials and hardship and a lifetime of blindness for his sheep. Jesus, the good shepherd, seeks, calls, and leads out his own sheep. Let's look thirdly at their response. Let's look at the sheep. In verse 3 through 5, we see the loyalty of the good shepherd's sheep. What do they do? They hear, they follow, and they reject. Verse 3, to the shepherd the doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, verse 4, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger, they simply will not follow, but they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. They hear, they follow, and they reject. First of all, they hear the shepherd's voice, verse 3. A lamb can recognize its new mother's bleating amongst a thousand sheep. I know we, we have learned that sheep are not particularly intelligent animals. But this they have. They can recognize the sound of a mother's bleating. And they learn to recognize the sound of their shepherd. You can have multiple shepherds in a pen, mixed flocks in the sheepfold. The shepherds will go to their corners, separate from each other, and then call out their sheep with their individualized sing-song voices. And the sheep will go to the corners where their shepherds are. And the shepherds can lead them out. 
Notice how that is played out in John 9. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had put the man out. Finding him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? There was no confusion. Think about this. The man was blind when he met Jesus. He went to the pool of Siloam called Sent and washed. This is likely the first time he's seen Jesus. But he knows him. How does he know him? By his voice, the authority, the command, the power. And Jesus asked him, do you believe in the son of man? A loaded title signifying Jesus' deity and messiahship. And the man born blind who believes in this one in front of him says, who is the son of man that I may believe? Here is a sheep listening hearing the voice of the shepherd. And Jesus explains, you've seen him and he's the one talking with you. He believes, he worships. The sheep hear his voice. The sheep follow the end of verse four. The sheep follow the shepherd because they know his voice. But there, there's something we learn about Jesus' sheep here, true sheep. They, they don't just hear his words. They heed them. They follow. It's possible to think of yourself as a sheep, as somehow belonging to Jesus because you've heard something about him. That doesn't make one a sheep. The Pharisees heard his words. They did not believe. They were not his sheep. They were condemned. But Jesus' sheep hear and they follow they know his voice. This indicates the relationship that they have with the sheep. This is a depiction of trust and exclusive loyalty. They follow him. They, they go where he goes. This is a picture of submission and obedience and compliance on the part of sheep. And the corollary to that is in verse 5. They, they not only follow the shepherd, but they reject pseudo-shepherds. A stranger they simply will not follow, but they flee from him. Because they don't know the voice of strangers. In the original here, this is a strong negation. This is the ain't no way kind of way to say no in Greek. They certainly will not follow. I read about tourists who had gone to Israel and they wanted to sort of test drive shepherding. And so they put on the clothes of the local shepherds, ostensibly with the odors of the clothes of the local shepherds. And they began to call out the sheep using the same verbiage that the shepherds had used and the sheep didn't follow. No takers. What was critical was the voice of the shepherd. They knew the shepherd. They weren't duped by the clothing. They weren't duped by the, even the smell. They weren't duped by the words uh, that were used in imitation. They knew the shepherd's voice. Sheep are defenseless. They don't have any self-protective ability against predatory animals. They're vulnerable. And sheep are therefore skittish around strangers. They will flee. They'll run away. When we think about what it means to hear Christ's voice, and, and maybe you heard Christ's voice for the first time in an apostate system. Maybe a backslidden denomination or a cult, some ism. Those religions that are out there that have branched off of Christianity. Religions like Islam, Eastern Orthodoxy, Greek Orthodoxy, Roman Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism. Those religions of the world that have their roots in the Bible the cults of our day, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons. They say things about Jesus. I read the Book of Mormon a number of years ago. I was stricken by how much cut and pasted King's English Bible showed up in Joseph Smith's made-up book. There's a lot of Jesus in there. 
And even though the Catholic Church historically has made it a point to bury the Bible and bury the printers of the Bible and the translators of the Bible and the deliverers of the Bible, they still have quite a bit of Bible in the stuff that they've said and written over the years. It is possible to hear Christ's voice in the milieu of a false system. In fact, I have family members who learned of Christ in a cult. I have friends who came to faith in a Southern California cult, lasted three weeks, and then got out. Whatever happened to me didn't happen to the rest of the people around here. Where do I hear that voice again? Sheep may be dumb, but they know their shepherd's voice. When God goes and gets his own and puts them out, excommunicates them, provides for them an individualized exodus from man-made religion, from man-made traditions, he cares for them. He goes before them. He leads them to green pastures. He's a good shepherd. Recognition of his voice over time requires familiarity with it. It is possible to lose your appetite for Christ's voice, to be distracted, to not have discernment, to confuse Christ's words with all the other various competitors and things out there. Let me just remind you that knowing Christ's voice in his word is a protection against deceptions. I think one of the reasons that God uses the imagery of sheep to describe us, his people, is because we tend to wander. Sometimes we like it around the fence line. And you know, there's some really cute sheep on the other side of the fence with the pointy ears and the fangs. <laughs> Sometimes the, they, they come into the, into the sheepfold. Familiarity with Christ's voice is a protection as an individual sheep and a protection for the church To to think about church history and to watch mainline denominations in the last century in our own country reject Christ, defect from his word, is a stark reminder that individual bodies of believers haven't stood the test of time. God has his sheep, and every once in a while there's an exodus from a church that goes awry from a denomination that goes sideways, even from a nation that had a a whole lot of really good churches, and now the percentage of genuine believers in a country is less than 1%. Think about that through church history. Where are the faithful churches that once thrived in North Africa, in modern-day Turkey, in Europe, in America? We need to know Christ's voice. And with it comes the discernment to know truth from error. I want you to consider this morning the contrast, two really, two contrasts in this passage. A contrast between Jesus and the leadership. What was Jesus' attitude towards the needy? To those who recognized that they actually needed him? What we might call the poor in spirit. Jesus' response was compassion, care, leadership, and love. What was Jesus' response to the hypocrites? Confrontation. And that confrontation comes for not only the perpetrators, but the adherents of man-made religion. You see, those who have made a deal with the false religious systems of the world have made a deal where they're life doesn't really have to change on the inside. They can go along with the externals, salve their conscience, think that they're okay with God, and hope that it's all going to be all right in the end, while still being slaves of sin. 
Jesus comes to those who recognize their need and offers compassion and life and joy. To those who don't see their need, who are spiritually blind, who say, I don't need repentance. I don't need a radical transformation. I don't need somebody to pay for my sins. I got this. There will only be confrontation. Only be the declaration of hypocrisy. I want to think for a moment about the way that we present Jesus in our world. Sometimes we face the temptation when lots of people reject Christ to market Christ. Do you ever feel this? If, if you work with engineers, I got to make Jesus sound like an engineer. I got to be real smart. If I work in a, a medical field, I, I've got to... I've got to impress everybody with the things that I know so that the Jesus that goes with me fits in their world. If you're a cattle rustling cowboy, you've got to make a cowboy Jesus. Whatever the environment, you, you try to just sort of make Jesus fit in with the culture. Don't you know that Jesus is radically opposed to the sinful cultures of the world? He, he seeks to redeem people out of those things. And granted, he will make a variety of people and a variety of flavors. But we don't market Jesus to suit the desires and the needs of an unbelieving world. They need the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of their imagination, not the Jesus that we could sell them. It's critically, critically important that we present the biblical Jesus, and not market him other than he is. And we have this confidence. We proclaim Jesus and his sheep will come. We proclaim him. We, we give the world his words and his sheep will come out and they will follow him. We convince people that, that they can have a, a little bit of, bit of Jesus of their own making or a little bit of Jesus that, that we construe to their own ideas and just add that to their lives. And they will not have life. They will not have met the good shepherd. They will have found somebody who can assure them that their idolatries are okay. Jesus did not come to make sinful man's life feel a little bit better. He came to give life, to rescue, to bring about a radical transformation, and to usher you into his good care. He is the good shepherd, and there is no other. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. You are the good shepherd the good shepherd par excellence. You are the one who laid down your life as a sheep to be the sacrifice in our place to bring us to God. You are tender, compassionate, kind. You are our shepherd. And because of that, we have no want you bring us to lie down in green pastures and beside quiet waters. You restore our souls. You guide us in the paths of righteousness for your own name's sake. And even though we walk through a very dark valley at times, we fear nothing. For you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of enemies. You anoint our heads with oil and our cups overflow. Truly goodness and loving kindness, your goodness and your loving kindness will pursue us all the days of our lives. And Lord Jesus, we will dwell in your house forever.